Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending upon where you are. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you all are enjoying your day. Uh, depending upon where you are in the country, you might be getting uh, a little bit of weather. I know in this part of the country we are. And so anyway, uh, it's warm inside this house. So I want to go ahead and jump to it. One of the things that people do, something that people often say, and is usually in response to a disagreement, the way they counter or come back after a disagreement oftentimes is by questioning or impugning the use of Hebrew or Greek. Now, let's just be clear. Most people who have an issue, if not all who have an issue with Hebrew or Greek, only have an issue with using Hebrew or Greek if it doesn't suit them, because they may go to the Strong's Concordance, they might look up a word, they might go online and look up a word. That's no problem. That's no problem at all. Uh, but it is a problem when you don't like it because it doesn't work for you, but you only like it when it does work for you. Now, I want to cover some passages, obviously. And so uh, I want to start off and some of you are like this. I'll start off reading a passage, a couple passages that kind of just gives us direction when it comes to reading the scriptures. And we will start off in Proverbs 4, 7. And of course, we'll go ahead and just for the sake of some, <laughs> we'll read out of the King James Version. I actually like this this passage, this translation, wisdom, verse seven, uh, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. And so whenever we read the Bible, whatever we do, uh, as it pertains to this, we should try to get understanding. If you don't understand what it is you're reading, what it is you're talking about, well, then, you know, I mean, I won't give you the name of what you are. Uh, but it's just not wise, right? Uh, we're also told, uh, according to the Bible, and we'll just go back to the passage, but this is in 2 Timothy 2.15. You all have seen this. Uh, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And so now in the, uh, in the King James or New King James, it'll say rightly dividing. We want to, when we read the Bible, we want to be able to handle the scriptures. We want to be able to divide them. We want to know what it's saying, why it's saying what it's saying. And let's just be clear, because I don't think everyone has gotten this. It doesn't matter what you think about the scriptures or what you think they say. It matters what it actually says. Sometimes, though, it's hard to kind of get to that, right? Sometimes it's hard to, to get to the matter, to get to the meat, because obviously how I think, what I think, the way I feel, that's obviously the correct way. But then the next person is going to say the same thing. Well, no, no, no. What I feel, what I think, my understanding is the correct way. So here's the question. What happens when two people, and let's just say they both love the Lord, they are both believers, they both have the Holy Spirit, differ on a passage? Now, there are Christians in this chat, and there are Christians that are going to watch. There are going to be Christians in the comment section who differ, who disagree. There's a lot of topics that we can cover, either topical or just going over a particular passage or a book, and we'll disagree. So what do we do when we disagree? And we're disagreeing over what? Because we're here in America, and obviously because we're in America, uh, then America is superior and English is superior, right? We think that, this is how we do sometimes, we think that because of where we are, where we're from, that it must be the best way to do it. And so what happens when you come to a passage that two people who are reading, let's say, an English text can't understand it or, or can't come to an agreement? If only there was some way to figure this out. If only there was some way to get to the heart of the matter. Well, what does the Bible say uh, about the scriptures? It says that all scripture is what? God breathed. And so if it's God breathed, then obviously we know it, it, it is what is profitable for, for teaching, for correcting, for instruction, so that we will all be complete, lacking nothing. So what um, if it's inspired, if it's God breathed, the question is this, who inspired it and what was inspired? Because if I ask you your Bible and even in even in looking at. Uh, some of the chats before I put the uh, the message in, and I don't know why you guys do this. I'm getting on. I'm getting on you guys in the chats. You guys instinctively, some of you guys went to King James version, any NASB or ESV, NIV. Well, that's not the discussion, is it? Because we we get 
sometimes we get a little defensive, protective about a particular book, about a particular translation. So let me ask you guys this question. <clears throat> if the scriptures, all the scriptures were God inspired, who inspired them? Who inspired them? Well, the Holy Spirit. Now, because the question is going to be is, and I've, I've been I've been accused of this. And so I want to pull this out. I've been accused of using too much of the Greek or Hebrew uh, instead of the Holy Spirit. That you don't you don't let the spirit move. You don't you don't you lean more on the uh, the the script, not the scripture, but you lean more on the Greek or these these tools than you do the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to flesh that out in a little bit and just kind of cover that. But I want to start off by saying if I lean on the Greek or the Hebrew and you, Mr. Person or ma'am, say that uh, you you lean on the on the Holy Spirit. What did the Holy Spirit didn't wasn't the Holy Spirit the one who gave us the text? What was inspired, guys? Was what language I should say were the scriptures sovereignly inspired? What were they inspired in English? I know somebody's gonna say, well, wait a second. I speak English, God gave me my Bible in English. Okay, <laughs> is that true? Did God give you your Bible in English? No, he didn't. He did not. Now, did he did he make way for you to have an English translation? Sure, just like there's a way for uh, us to have a Spanish translation, a um, Mandarin translation. There are French translations. There are German translations as well. There are Arabic, Aramaic translations. Now, they all, if we line them up, won't say everything exactly the same way. Because if you ask a translator, and there are people today, there are many people on this planet who are part of different translation committees, and not one, not even, not even the original translators, whether it's Erasmus, whether it is, um, uh, uh, I'm about to say Justin, whether it's Jerome, whether it's Tyndale, whether it's the translation committee for even the King James Version. Not one will you find say that they did a perfect work and that it requires constant translation. OK, because there's just no way that you can take a word in any language and put it in English. And so what we do sometimes is I, and let's just be honest, I'm going to be honest, guys. We get a bit tribal when we start thinking that this particular translation is the superior one. Um, we talk about, wait a second, these words are missing out of this book. This word is missing out of that book. That book is not the inspired word. What was not inspired by God. What was not God breathed, guys, was the ESV. That was not God breathed. The NASB, that was not God breathed. Uh, uh oh, I'm bowling down some alleys. The King James nor the New King James Version were God inspired, nor were the, was the NIV, okay, and any other translation. None of those translations were God inspired. What was God inspired was what the people actually wrote, their writing of the message. And their writing is, their writing is uh, in the language that they speak. And so, no. Uh, so, yeah, Doug, no, I'm not saying God is incompetent. I'm saying humans are. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying when God inspired, let's say, Paul uh, to write or when Peter, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote or when uh, James wrote or when Moses wrote, that was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But you know what they didn't think of? They didn't think of what's the how can I put this in a way to where these people who speak English are going to get it? No, they just gave it. And now, obviously, God knew that there were going to be English speaking people. He knew that. He knew there were going to be people that spoke Spanish. He knew there were going to be people that spoke all these different languages. And so um, he also sovereignly caused it to where people would translate. But the issue is going to be, though, um, is the translation perfect? Well, no. And it didn't have to be because when they translate, and I'm, kind of, I'm almost even getting, getting off of the intended, but when they translated the scriptures, uh, they're not trying to translate it verbatim. They can't. It's, it's, it is impossible, guys, impossible to translate the Greek and Hebrew verbatim into English. Doesn't happen. It can't happen. OK, now you find somebody on the find, I tell you what, find somebody on the translation committee that would disagree. Find one. You won't. And what's happened is because we've held on to a particular book so long, that we venerated the book. We, we, we get on Catholics for venerating Mary. Well, we've done the same thing to our Bible. And that's not the case. Why, why do you all think that God did not preserve the original manuscripts? Why do you think we don't have the original handwritings of John or the original handwritings of 
of Peter or Paul, the original handwritings of Matthew, the original handwritings of, of uh, Jonah. Why? Well, because he's not after even the verbatim. He's after the message. How do I know? When we when we read or, or, or hear what Jesus is quoting, when Jesus quotes the Old Testament, matter of fact, most people in the New Testament, when they quote the Old Testament, about 80% of what they quote is not out of the Hebrew manuscripts. No, it is out of the Greek Septuagint. Now, do we rely on the Greek Septuagint? No, we don't. But for whatever reason, they did. They, they quoted out of it. Why is that? Well, because it's the message, not necessarily the word. I use this example all the time. It is 511, here, my time. But if someone were to say it's 11 after 5, said the same thing two different ways, both are fine. The message is what's important, right? Not exactly how I said it, okay? Or if someone were to use military time, it is 1711, same thing. So we get caught up on the small things and we can never get to the big things. Now, this is in no way to denig to uh, to to uh, demonize any particular translation, because that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about translations. Now, I'm going to do a couple of exercises and go over some passages, and we can look at it in the Hebrew. I mean, Hebrew. We can look at it in the ESV. We can look at it in the King James Version, New King James. Uh, we can look at it in ASB. Doesn't matter. We're going to actually look at the, the actual text, and then we're going to see um, some things that we ought to kind of kind of glean from it. So now, my point, though, when someone comes back and says, hey, you rely too much on the Hebrew and Greek. Well, <clears throat> do you know what takes precedent even over the King James Version? Do you know what takes precedence over the NIV? Do you know what takes precedence over the ESV, the NASB, the Greek and Hebrew? Why? Because that's the closest that we have to the originals. More because you all do realize that whatever English version you have is a uh commentary on that particular language. So when you read the English, King James, New King James, NASB, any of those, it is a commentary on the original language. It's, it's them saying what they think this passage actually says. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can, how we can kind of get to um, the meat of it, the heart of it. And even if a person doesn't know Hebrew or Greek, um, how do we get to it? <clears throat> but then I've got to come back to the original question. Uh, one, and I put, I, I didn't even check and see what the result of the of the poll is. Uh, I do want to see that, but is is there a chance that that I could possibly be using the Greek too much or the or the Hebrew too much? Well, I say no. By the way, by the way, if you if you just went through, if anyone were to do so, and and I, I've instructed the person who made this claim. I tell you what, go back and just look at the videos on the channel. You know, the mo the majority of the videos on the channel, we don't even talk about Hebrew or Greek. And so when we're talking about doctrine, though, when we're going over certain teachings, then I will um, cover a Greek or the Hebrew if it brings out something in the scripture, if it illuminates a little bit more. OK, now I've said this. I don't think that everyone needs to learn Hebrew or Greek to understand the Bible. I don't think that at all. Uh, I do think two people who ought to who ought to learn Hebrew and Greek. Two people. If you're a pastor, I think all pastors should have some sort of familiarization with Hebrew and Greek. They don't have to be proficient, have to be scholars or anything, but just, just a working understanding of it. Uh, I think that people, anyone that wants to gain a deeper knowledge of the scriptures should learn Hebrew and Greek, or at least some aspect of it. Now, since the scriptures were inspired, since sovereignly, and you all have to take this up with God, God determined that the Old Testament would be written primarily in Hebrew. God determined that primarily the New Testament would be written in Greek and that there's also going to be some uh, Aramaic in there. So if he determined that long before you or I came along, you know, what I don't have to do. I don't have to have, this, have that battle with anyone about how much Hebrew or Greek someone ought to use, because the very same scriptures that I'm talking about was given by who? the Holy Spirit. So you can't come back and say that a person uses too much Hebrew, too much Greek, and not enough Holy Spirit. No, um, I am in Holy Spirit country when I'm trying to get to the heart of the matter. Am I 100% successful in using Hebrew Greek? Nope, nope, nope. Couldn't say that. Uh, there's there's no one who is 
100% perfect, even in their translation, none. And so it's just a tool to kind of help get us closer. Now, the English is fine. The, Eng the English is fine. And so if a person wants to grow under the uh, just the English, without question, you can. Without question, you can get to, you could understand every doctrine forwards and backwards if you've never heard or even studied or learned Hebrew and Greek. You just can. And, and out of the major translations that either being out of the King James Version, New King James, ESV, NASB, any of that stuff. OK. Um, and so. So I want to be clear that I'm not saying that that you have to learn Hebrew or Greek to get closer. Um, if you feel like you have to learn Hebrew and Greek to get closer to God, then you're not getting closer to God. That's not how you get closer to God. Uh, but it is just. Uh, I heard a story put this way. Uh, when it came to trying to encourage people to learn the languages about a man who married a woman from a different country. Uh, she understood him enough, but she still primarily spoke in her native tongue and she would do different things to try to uh, get to know her um, and to try to, you know, you know, deepen their relationship and her understanding and to show how much he loved her. And so what he did was he decided to learn her language because that way there would be no barrier between them communicating. And so he did. Well, it's kind of the same thing that we do when we try to learn Hebrew or Greek. OK, now, what if, though, because I don't have the time to learn Hebrew or Greek. It does take some time. Right. It, it takes some study. You don't just pick it up. And a lot of the rules in Hebrew and Greek, there are some that are familiar to English. There are some that are not. And so what I want to do, guys, is I want to kind of go over some things. Now, I've noticed something, though, about the people who have told me that uh, you lean on the on the languages too much, that you lean on the Hebrew and Greek too much. Again, I, I don't think there's a such thing as leaning on the Hebrew and Greek too much because the very Bible that you read, somebody leaned on the Hebrew and Greek an awful lot to bring it to you. OK, and to me, it, it has been oftentimes someone who has been, uh, how do I put it? They've been in the category of, of Pentecostal or charismatic cult or kids. Pentecostal and charismatic because they would rather have a move of the spirit without understanding what the move of the spirit is in the word. And so they would rather lean on their experience than they would um, the Bible. There is this movement, guys, in our country, this anti-intellectualism, where we don't think that understanding something in our head is important, that we ought to feel it. And people who feel it, we find them doing these strange things. We find these these cults. We find these folks um casting sleep demons out of people. We, we find these people with these who don't understand um, that our head has to be connected with our heart. We find them um, casting snakes out of people, right? We, we find them making people spit up demons. We find them having kids um, prophesy and lay hands. That's, that's what um, this anti-intellectualism that we have in this country has coming. And, it, and it's happening for some reason, for the most part, primarily in the church community, where we don't think that understanding is important and that deeping and delving into the scriptures is important. It is. It is. And so if I want to divide a passage, if I want to get to the heart of it, how do I do so? How do I do so? And it's not to tell someone who doesn't know my language, first learn English, and then you'll you'll get this. OK, no, uh, it is in whatever language you are, parse this thing, go into it. And if you can also get an understanding in the Hebrew or Greek, then fine. But what if you never learned Hebrew and Greek, but you could, I don't know, figure out how to use some of the tools. And we'll kind of use just a, a little bit of the tools. And so you can kind of see what I'm what I'm talking about. OK, but then you also have the cults. The cults don't like um, C-U-L-T-S. The cults do not like Hebrew and Greek, not for themselves. The, jo the, the Jehovah's Witnesses of the world. They don't like it because it exposes uh, their heresy. And then those the kids, those who are immature. People who are immature think that their way is the only way. And we've got a lot of that. We've got a lot of that on all different sides. OK. And so it's this lack of desiring, this lack of understanding, this lack of wanting to be uh, wrong. I get no one wants to be wrong, but some people are just unwilling to even have just the, a hint of being incorrect. You better be able to say that I might be incorrect about something that way um, because you prevent yourself from learning. So anyway. Uh, that being said, I want to go over some passages and I want to show you some things um, that might cause or might help us to 
to just learn a little bit more about the scriptures. Uh, I'm going to cover a passage that you all, you all probably have never even thought about, uh, that these are passages where the languages might help a little bit. OK, so some of this, some of you guys may have heard me cover this passage before. Proverbs 22, 6. Now, I've got this up in, oh, this is still in the King James Version. OK, uh, it says train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, let me come back to the screen because I want to ask you guys a question. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart. Some of you heard me talk about this passage before. Some of you have not. And so those of you who have not, or really anyone, tell me what does this passage mean? I'll put it back on the screen. You guys tell me what this passage means. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart. So guys in the chat, I'm looking for you to tell me what do you think this passage in Proverbs 22, 6 means? Again, I'm picking out passages that um, are illuminated a little bit more in the um, in the languages. And so I just want to kind of see what what some of you guys are seeing. Then I'm, I'm going to show you um, how we can find out what it means. OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, it says direct the child. Alberto says direct the child. OK. We ought to direct the child in the way that he should go. Uh, let's see. He will not depart from the training as a child. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Let's see. It means, uh, teach your child and he will, uh, go back to Christ. Teach the child by example. Now here's the, here's the problem with this passage, the way it's written. Let me go back to it again. Here's the problem with this passage, the way it's written. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. The problem with this passage is it, it presents a conundrum, and that is, well, wait a second. I know I've trained my child as best a person could. Showed them all the things they're supposed to do. And you know what? This child has departed from this teaching. This child is not acting the way they're supposed to act. Now, somebody come back and say, well, maybe you didn't train them in the way that they should go. Maybe it, it's maybe it wasn't a child. Maybe it was your training that did it. OK, fine. Well, what about God? Is there a better father than him? God has children. Think about the children of Israel. He trained them, taught them, led them. But let's let's apply God's training to even to us and the children of Israel. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Are there people in Israel who departed from their training? Sure, there were people who in Israel departed from their training. So what gives God that? that because what you say should be 100% true. In this case, it's, it is absolutely not 100% true that if we train a child up, that he is always going to go in the way that he's been trained and he'll never depart it. So something's wrong. Either there's something wrong with your word as I read it, or there's something wrong with how it's written. Uh, there's the key. So let's go back to the passage. I'm going to show you that the way it's written could probably be written better. Let me show you what I mean. The very first word there, it is the same word. It is, um, it's a train up. Okay. Now, what it is, is the question is, is this a command or, guys, is it a warning? Now, I'm a, before I get to that, though, I want to show you something. Where it says, train up a child in the way that he should go. What it says here is, al pani derko. Al, right here, look at the bottom. It says, al, upon, p, al p, the mouth, upon the mouth, derko. Upon the mouth of his way. So train up a child upon the mouth of his way. Have any of you ever heard that passage? Have any of you ever heard it put that way? Train up a child upon the mouth of his way. I'm, I doubt that most people have heard that passage or have heard it, heard it put that way. Train up a child upon the mouth of his way. I'll pee there go. But guys, again, that is how it's literally written in the Hebrew. 
Okay, Al P. Derko. So what does that mean then, Corey? If, if one, what does it mean? And two, why does it say that? Why is it translated this way in the English? I'll cover both ways. Uh, I'll cover it both ways. Uh, when it comes to why is it in the English this way? Well, it made sense the way it was written when it was written. Sometimes a passage, um, it gains a certain favor and uh, tradition or preference keeps certain words out or keeps certain words in. Let me give you an example. When Tyndale translated the New Testament into Greek, when he was doing his translation, he didn't use the word um, church. He used the word gathering. OK, he used a different word. However, later uh, the translations went with church. OK, um, the reason why Tyndale wanted to go with 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 his word was because he felt that it, it, it gave a better understanding of what um, the church or the gathering or the assembly is. That's why. So sometimes you're going to have a passage that just follows tradition. Sometimes a passage like we just like it that way. And even when it was written, it was understood to mean what the text was saying. But here's a problem with English. And it's problem with probably this. I imagine the same with every other language, but definitely with English, definitely with Greek, definitely with Hebrew. The problem is this. Words change over time. OK, meaning of words, the meaning of words change. And sometimes uh, we've got a word, one word that can mean four or five different meanings. Where it presently, where it initially only had one meaning, or we can have four or five words that mean this one thing. Okay, um, I use the example of bank. Uh, what does the word bank mean? Different meanings, right? What does the word fine mean? Different meanings for f i n e. Even even a word that shouldn't even be that difficult. What does the word uh, bad mean? What does the word cool mean? So. We've got new words brought in. We've got words that aren't words that become words. We've got words that are words that they change their meaning. Words morph over time. And so therein lies the problem with, with even the translators, right? So that being said, that's why it says train up a child because that's kind of, that's how it was written initially. Okay. Now, what does it actually say? Al, al P. Derko. And what does that mean? Al P. Derko means according to his bin. Upon the mouth of his way, is an idiom. Every language has them. An idiom is kind of a way that we say certain things. So upon the mouth of his way means according or the way that he should go. Meaning it's written this way because this is the way that he wants to go. So train up a child in the way that he wants to go or according to the mouth of his way, according to the mouth of his way means his bent, how he is. So in other words, if your child, if this child is an angry child, this child has fits of rage. Uh, if you train him up that way, if you train up your child according to his natural bent, when he's old, he will be that way. If your child is lazy, that's his natural bent. That's the mouth of his way. According in the way that he should go, he is lazy. If you train that lazy child up to be lazy, to stay lazy, when he's old, guess what? He will continue to be lazy. And when he's old, he will not depart it. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So now, oh, that makes sense. Uh, the old saying, you can't te teach an old dog new trick. Well, this guy who is, let's say he's lazy at 70. Well, he's been lazy. He didn't He didn't get to 70 and become lazy. He was lazy at 60. He was lazy at 50. This guy with his anger problem, same thing. This guy who's messy, this woman's me same thing. If you train them according to their natural, and, and guess what? We all have a natural sin bent. And so the writer is saying, if you train them according to that way, it's not saying train. So what it is, it's not a uh, a command. It's a warning. If you train according to his his bent, he'll be that way. Now, if his bent is a good bent, if if if, if the mouth of his way or uh, the way that he should go, it's good. And he is a polite person. Then when he's old, he'll be polite. That's how that works. OK, now I want to throw a passage in here that never gets. No, we don't really notice it often. Uh, we don't see that it there. It's probably a mistake. Uh, in the way that it's written, let me show it to you. And it's and by the way, guys, this is in every translation. In Amos six twelve, it says, uh, "Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood." Now, what this passage is talking about 
is it's using it's supposed to be using two examples of doing the wrong thing the wrong way or doing something the wrong way. Like, for example, do horses run on rocks? Well, no, horses, let me put it back on the screen. Horses do not run on rocks. Okay. Now here's but the problem is right here D on the second uh, part. Does one plow there with oxen? Well, yeah, you do plow with oxen, but this is supposed to be two goofy things, two incorrect things to prove a point for the second part, but you have turned justice into poison. Well, here's a problem. Let me go back to the passage in Hebrew. Uh, this word here with oxen is this word right here. Is this word right here, uh, bikarim, or is it bikur? And then the word is supposed to be separated. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm asking, and this is why we believe that this prob is probably um, an error, because in Hebrew, guys, in Hebrew, as hard as that is to read in Hebrew, there are, one, there's no vowel markings in Hebrew originally, and then all the words, all the letters aren't really run together. So there is no space between one word and the next word. So either this is uh, bikr yam, which means do oxen plow on the sea? Or do, I mean, uh, do you plow the sea with an ox? Or is it, do you plow with oxen? So is it plural oxen uh, where the yad mean comes in, make, making it plural? Or is it the yam, which means the sea? Which one is it? Well, it's probably not what we have here. It's probably a separation between these two words right here. Okay. It's probably that these two words right here need to be separated. Okay. The yad mean, and then that would form uh, the C. So, and then it would make sense because yeah, horses don't, horses don't run on rocks because if they ran on rocks, they would break their heel. Uh, and um, you don't plow the sea with an ox but we left it there. Why? Well, you'd have to ask the translations committee. It could, it, it could, could be because they felt like it should be oxen or it could be just out of tradition. Now, the other way, the one that I'm saying with the two words separated, it makes the passage make a little bit more sense because we're talking about something that doesn't make sense to prove the point, right? So now we don't talk about that often, but it's just one of those things that come up when you, you know, when you start doing a little bit of a Hebrew study. So uh, let me give you some passages in the English that are kind of more illuminated by the Greek. As a matter of fact, let me put it on screen. I'll show it in the English. You all, you all know this passage. Uh, there's some debate about this passage. And let's see if we can get to the heart of the matter just by using the Greek. This spirit influence inspired passage. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. So the question is going to be, the question is going to be, well, what is a gift of God? Is it the faith um, that you've been saved uh, or is it that you've been saved? Are we trying to say that our faith is, what's, is, what the, is what the gift of God is or the salvation from God? Is that the gift? Now, um, you all have heard me talk about a man by the name of William Mounts before. Uh, he's got a, do I have his book out? I got it somewhere back there. I'll pull it out in a little bit. But he's got a book. Uh, I, I love the book. It's called uh, Basics of Biblical Greek. I've got the old version, but the Basics of Biblical Greek. Uh, and he covers, he teaches how to, you know, for first year students, how to learn Greek. And he's got some other little tools as well. And so before I get to it, I want to pull this back up on the screen. This is the passage we're looking at. And so the question is, is there is there a way that we can know for sure what is a gift. Now, before I go there, guys, let me ask you a question. What do you think is the gift? When he says this, this, the second half, this latter half, it says it is, it is the gift of God. What is the gift? Is it salvation or is it faith? Which do you think? Do you think it's salvation that's the gift of God? Or do you think faith is the gift of God? Give me in your, in the chats, I'd, I'd like to know, um, I like to see where, where you guys are thinking. Then I want to pull up mounts and let you hear what he's saying. OK, no name. Uh, just because he says it is salvation. Mr. K says both. Uh, Patrick says both. Monkey Moo says both. Enola says 
uh, salvation. Meek Spirit says salvation. Steve says salvation. David says salvation. Well, question. It, what about the faith? Is is faith? How do we know it's talking about both? Is there a way? Now, you know what? Without any, any further ado, let me go ahead and play this clip for Mount. And I'll stop it because I'm going to have to explain something in the middle of it. So let me just go ahead and play this. So Paul writes, for by grace, instrumental dative, you are saved, paraphrastic, perfect, through faith, semicolon, and this not of yourselves, of God the gift, not out of works, in order that no one can boast. Just a quick grammatical note on this paraphrastic. You have the present of a me and a perfect participle that makes it a paraphrastic perfect. Originally, paraphrastics were created to emphasize the ongoing aspect of something, but that's been basically lost by the time of the Koine. So this is translated as a simple perfect. You have been saved. The other Now... What he's talking about is he says, well, you have been saved. He's, he's bringing up the perfect. He's talking about how it was or should be or could have been a uh, paraphrastic phrase, a uh, uh, perfect. And he basically says, almost don't even worry about the fact that it's paraphrastic. Just just is perfect, which is why he says you have been been saved, which, by the way, the Greek tells us since it says you have been saved and it's a perfect. That means that our salvation came back way back when. How back? How far back when? Don't know. Now, of course, we're in Ephesians. And so he already, he's already told us in Ephesians 1 that our salvation came back from the beginning of the earth, the foundation of the earth. And so that's why the perfect tense is there. So let's go ahead and continue what he's saying. The interesting thing about the Greek is the tuta, which is neuter, and there's no neuter for it to go back to. Now, in Greek, there's no, we don't worry about word order in Greek. Okay. And I'm going to show you that in just a little bit. Um, in English, we'll have John through Bob the ball. So we'll have John. He is a noun, but he is a subject. He threw the verb, the ball. Uh, so to John, I mean to Bob. So we've got the direct object and the indirect object. Well, in Greek, you might not have that in that order. Okay. Word order doesn't matter. And so it might be, everything might be flipped. Well, how do we know what's the direct object? How do we know what's the indirect object? How do we know what's the, and there might be a couple of nouns in there. Uh, in this case, uh, Bob threw the ball or John threw the ball. We've got John, Bob, and ball. All of those are nouns. Which one is the subject? Okay. We obviously can figure out which one is the verb. So, um, but what happens is the words have to agree in what's called case. And so if he's talking about it being in the neuter, well, there's nothing else in this passage that's in the neuter that he's referring to. So how do we know what he's talking about? And he's going to explain. You might think that this not of yourselves would refer to being saved or God's expression of grace, which is feminine. This is masculine. Faith is feminine. So why a neuter tuta? Well, the basic rule in Greek is that when you want to refer back, not to a specific word, but to a more general concept, you put the pronoun in the neuter. And so this means that tuta refers to this entire process of gracious salvation by faith. That whole thing is not of us. We don't do that. It's God's gift. So seeing the Greek tells us, rather than fighting over which one it is, and some of you all said both, and some will say, no, it's not both. It's salvation. No, it's not salvation. No, it, it's it's just faith or it's the faith that we get salvation. Well, um, because the neuter, because this particular rule, and I won't go into the rule, but that whole thing is brought under because he uses the neuter to say all of that is uh, from God, the, the salvation and the faith. So there's an example of how just knowing the Greek can illuminate it. But now let's say if you don't know the rule, but you just know so, just some basic parts of Greek so when they explain, when someone like a Bill Mounts or a Wallace or whoever else will give an explanation, you can at least run with it, right? So uh, someone asked, am I getting your emails? I may or may not be. I've got 300 emails and guys, I can promise you this. Uh, I might, I may or may not get all those emails, 
or get to them. There's just so many. By the way, guys, let me just say this <laughs> quick word. Um, sending messages, there's like 30 messages on Messenger I haven't got. Y'all, I may or may not get to them. Okay, so uh, I'm doing my best here. <laughs> anyway, now I want to do a couple other passages because you have heard me talk about, matter of fact, before I go, let me, let me throw another passage on the screen. I want to give another another one. This was kind of cool. Uh, in Luke twenty two forty two, this is where Jesus is in the garden and he's praying. He says, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Well, do you all think that, because it seems like it, do you think that Jesus was praying to the Father to get a different way, another way out? I don't, oh man, I don't, this crucifixion, Lord, Father, God, it's going to hurt. And I don't want to get crucified. I don't want to get beaten and I don't want to get crucified. Can you help? Can you help a son out? Can you help a brother out? I don't want to get crucified. Is that what Jesus was praying? Was Jesus asking to remove this cup? I want you to think about that for a second. Was Jesus asking God, the Father, to remove this cup? Was he saying, can we figure out something different than me being crucified? Think about that. Was Jesus asking for there to be some other way? All right. So now put your put your answer out there. Anna says, nope. Pastor Gary says, nope. So, OK, so fine. You all are saying Jesus wasn't asking that. Sylvia says, no, Jesus wasn't asking that. Now, if we say uh, if we say that uh, Jesus is not asking for that, for the cup to be taken away, let's go back to the passage. If Jesus is not asking for this cup to be taken away, why is he saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup? Why is that? Hmm. Everyone else is saying no. Now, you have all these people saying no. No doubt, though, you guys have heard people say you've heard. I've heard preachers say this. I've heard people on YouTube say that uh, here's somebody with a, uh, with an awesome and I do mean awesome name. <laughs> says no. Hey, Corey. Uh, no, Jesus was not asking that. OK, Kevin says, yes, he was praying that some people say uh, yes. Some people say no. And I've heard a lot of preachers preach this. That he's asking for this cup to be removed. Well. He's not asking for this cup to be removed. Remember who he is. Remember, we say Jesus is God. Remember what Jesus said. He says that no one takes my life. I come to lay it down. And if I lay it down, I pick it back up. He's always talked about what he's come to do. He's talked about what the father sent him to do and what he's desired to do. We know that from eternity past. He has had this in mind. We know that from the Old Testament talks about him coming to do that. Him in the Old Testament saying he's going to do that. So he's already stated why he's coming. So why would he make this statement out to be? Or why would it seem to us as though, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me? Well, a couple of things. First of all, there's no one there to hear him praying this, right? Um, the other the other three, what are they doing while he's praying this? They're knocked out. They're sleeping. Right now, there's some anguish there and I won't get into the whole anguish. The reason why there's this anguish there between what he's doing, but you can make a statement. You can say something and phrase it in the form of a question. But I want to point something out in the Greek. In the Greek. There's this word here, if you are willing, OK, if you go over to the right here, this word boule. Boule. Now it can be, excuse me. You can say it means to will or or to want, but it's not like the desire that will. This is kind of a planning, kind of a an ordain ordination. Have you planned for me? If Father, if you are planning this, then remove this cup. But he's not planning this, and that's his point. Is he, he does the exact same thing? He uses the exact same. Um, grammatical uh, 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 thing that he does here. He does the exact same thing when he's on the cross. When he says, oh, uh, uh, Elo, Elo, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and so when he does that, he's not asking, why, why am I being crucified? 
And he's not asking, obviously he knows why. He's doing it to make a point. Now, the point may not be obvious to us, but it should be. Why is this cup coming? Because somebody, somebody uh, needs to have this wrath poured out on them. Somebody needs to take this. And this is why. And there won't be anyone else that's going to come and take this wrath. There won't be, uh, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? You can't, because you can't be forsaken. It wouldn't matter. You couldn't be saved, but he can take all of that and then us be saved. That's his point. He's asking a question um, and him asking a question is the answer. Are you with me? So anyway, now I want to do something that's kind of, I think will help because someone's going to say, well, okay, Corey, all that's night, nice and neat, but uh, I don't know Greek. So what can I do in the meantime? Well, I've stated before that you guys can get a, an interlinear. Now, it depends on what type of interlinear. Now, as luck would have it for me, the interlinear that I'm using or that I have on here is not the interlinear that I would recommend you guys to get. If you all want to just get a, a decent understanding without having to learn Greek, uh, you can get an interlinear with, with a transliteration. Okay? Let me just show you what a transliteration does not look like since I don't have one. <laughs> um, here I've got over here the English. And matter of fact, yeah, I've got the English and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do you guys one favor. I'll put it in the King James version. How about that? Bam. I'll get rid of this ESV because it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. Can I move this over? Yeah, I can. All right. Uh, let me put this over here. Nope. All right. So now. I've got the King James Version over here the, of, of John 1, 6. I've got the Greek over here, and I've got what's called the interlinear. Now, as we read this, uh, here is what the transliter well the transliteration would be. I'm going to give you the transliteration. I'll say it, even though I don't have it here. As you read it, for, verse 6 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, here it is in the Greek. It says, uh, Egeneta Anthropos. And it, and it became or came a man, uh, apostolamonus, uh, which is uh, being sent. Now, this is in the, uh, the participle. So he is being sent, paratheu, which is from God. And it says here, onoma autu iones, which is named to him, John, which is kind of. Now, if I were to give the transliteration of this, it would say this. Came a man being sent from God named to him John. And so if you had if you had an interlinear, you would have that underneath the um, the regular Greek and under or to the side of the English translation. So what we would do is we would take that rough transliteration and then we would give it the nice, smooth English way of saying it. OK. And so sometimes like I'll give you I'll give you a famous example where we take the transliteration, you don't see it, but we turn around and change it into the English so that it can make sense to us. Remember I said in, in Greek, word order doesn't matter. Okay. Now, sometimes we change word order to give an emphasis. Same thing with Hebrew. What's the famous passage out of out of uh, John 1? Well, you guys know it. John 1.1. 1, 1. So let's go to John 1.1 1, 1 and put that back on the screen. And so it says... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Well, that's actually pretty pretty close to how it says in the Greek. Uh, and arche, in beginning was the Word, kaihalagos, and the Word, ain, prostantheon, and the Word was God. Now, the transliteration would say, and the Word was the God. Okay? And so, just if I were to give it just as just, just, just natural, just rough, rendering and the word was the God right now you don't say the God in English we would take off the the but it's there to get to let us know who we're speaking of okay the first time that that uh God shows up they shows up it shows up as God by the way let me make a point because someone's gonna gonna see this and and butcher this go back to this passage where it says uh here theos is from the word from the from the nominative theos but it is uh, theon. Well, there's a reason for that. Okay. Uh, don't get too caught up in the fact that the ending is a new rather than a sigma. Don't get caught up into that. Okay. 
because depending upon if a word is in the um, nominative, if it's in the dative, the genitive, the accusative, if it's in the plural, depending upon uh, what what declension is in, if it's in the first, second, or third declension, if it's plural, the ending will change, but it will still have the same meaning, right? So don't get caught up into that at all, okay? So um, let me go back to it. Now, here's where the word order changes in the Greek, and we have to flip, we have to change it in the English. Kai feos, and it's still the same theon, kai feos ain pros, uh, I mean, ain halagas. Well, let me give you guys a transliteration of this, okay? Uh, matter of fact, and it says, and God was the word. That's how, that's how it's written in the, in the Greek. Kai and theos, God, ain was halagas, the word. However, it doesn't say, and God was the word in English. It says, and the word was God. Okay. But well, wait a second. Um, why is that flipped? Because again, in Greek, word order doesn't matter. Now, sometimes the word might be moved to give emphasis. And so in this case, we see that. Uh, and so the, em the emphasis on this passage is, um, and God, and that doesn't have to be, a, a, we, we know it's a definite um, because it's already, we've, we've already been told it's definite because of the tontheon and Greek tells us we don't have to put the the uh, definite article in front of the theos. But anyway, but it says, and God was the word. Well, why does your Greek say, and the word was God? Because we know that the word, the word, the word, halagos is what's called the, um, the uh, uh, it's the subject. And theos is the predicate nominative. And so to give emphasis of what the theos, I mean, of what the lagos is, Theos is what it is, which is God, um, is put to the front of that. Okay? So, that's the reason for that. Now, the whole point of that, you're right. Um, uh, let me put it back up here. Not lost in translation yet. The emphasis is on God. Now, if I just know some Greek, then I can, I can kind of figure that out. But even if I don't, even if I don't know or understand Greek, but I've got a decent little understanding of it, just all right, um, then I could probably listen to someone explain it and it kind of makes sense. Kind of like how we did back in English uh, in, in high school or junior high and the teacher was telling us something and we wasn't following, but eh, because we had an idea of what English was, we speak it, it sort of made some sense, but then it, you know what it did, it went in one ear, not the other. But when we're looking at, when we're looking at the passage and we want to delve into it further, it's like, you know what? Okay, I see that. Now, this is one of those passages where anyone who doesn't believe that Jesus is God cannot deal with John 1, 1 because, because it's the predicate nominative. Theos is the predicate nominative and not the, and not the subject. It identifies what the subject halagas is. That is, the lagas is, halagas is God. So, but that's what Greek does. It helps us settle misunderstandings. It's not necessarily there to settle debates. <laughs> or argument, but it can, it should. Uh, somebody's going to say that, um, <laughs> someone's going to say, well, uh, that person, all he does is rely on Hebrew and Greek. Well, what do you rely on? It's certainly in the English. What do you rely on? Not, not, not you guys, but you all know recently I've, I've had some folks who had some, who had some differences with me and okay, fine. You had your differences. Um, and I'm going to the scripture and I'm going not just into that, the scripture that was translated, I'm going to how it was in the beginning. And I'm trying to see what does it say? And in the Greek, I'll go with that. Um, I'll go with that. And so if it's telling me one thing, then that's what it is. And so anyway, um, <laughs> okay, you're trying to come up with, with you trying to thwart a particular doctrine. I, I get it. I get it. You don't like the, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, this is Accordance Bible Software, guys. I need to get, they ought to give me some sort of, um, they ought to give me something for this, huh? They should be, they should, I should have got some sort of a uh, um, marketing agreement with them, huh? <laughs> anyway, all right, guys. So the point is this. There's no such thing, no such thing. Matter of fact, let me go to this thing. Let me click on here. I want to see what this, uh, what this poll was. All right. The poll had 75% um, that I used the Greek when needed. 12% says too much. 13 said not enough. 12% of you people are in sin. 
<laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I, listen, guys, I don't think that there's a such thing as using it too much unless unless you're using it to beat down somebody. OK, uh, and I would hope that I never do. And maybe I have. I can't say that I haven't. But if I ever speak over someone's head and not willing to go back and try to explain what it was that I said, then shame on me. Um, if I do it unintentionally, well, then it was unintentional. But if I do it to kind of to kind of put somebody down who's trying to learn, then that's wrong. OK, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it with the Greek or the Hebrew. And God, guess what, guys? There are people that I listen to just like, wow, I, OK, I, all right. Can you do me a favor? Can you can you spell that again? Can you go slower with that? Because I'm having problems understanding how you took that with that Greek or I took that with the Hebrew. OK, uh, I'm a little bit better with Greek than I am with Hebrew, which is funny because I started off with Hebrew. But the reason why I wanted to learn Greek or Hebrew, the only reason why is because I wanted through the spirit. I want to get cl closer to God. Now, y'all know my story. I had time. And so I took advantage of that time to. And here's what's funny, though. This is exactly how God works. This is it, it's amazing. There was an actual scholar, a Greek scholar that came to the prison that I was at. This is a scholar who actually co-authored a book with the scholar's scholar, Daniel Wallace. Uh, he has a book called Revisiting the Corruption of the New Testament. Here's how he ended up, how he found his way uh, at the prison that I was at. He was a chaplain. And he wanted to go into the ministry. He wanted to go. Um, he wanted to plant a church at some point in time. But he decided the best way to, to understand ministry was to go and minister to prisoners, to inmates. And so me seeing him and he's knowing that I'm learning Hebrew he says, well, you can also learn Greek at the same time. And so I've got him there. I, I was a sponge. I was soaking it up. Tell me this. Tell me that he gave me the, the first day, the first day he gave me this trick to understand uh, Greek uh, even better. Even he told me first, uh, I got some my first to identify all the definite articles. And so I'm looking for how to totan, all of that stuff, the ate taste tain. These are the, the, the Greek words for the, um, learn that, learn all the nominative, the singular, the plural, the, uh, the, not nominative, but all the, uh, the uh, masculine, singular and plural, all of the feminine, singular and plural, all of the neuter, singular and plural. And it helped. I would go in and I would circle that stuff. I would identify it. And then it helped me to understand them to understand who's been talked to. Because if this word is um, in the nominative, then the word that's, that we're trying to figure out it, what, what's modifying it. If it's also in the nominative, it's going to be in the same case ending as the word that it's modifying. Adjectives are going to be written the same way as the uh, as the word that's modifying. Same with the adverbs and so forth. And so that was prepositions as well. Um, Pro, I'm not purposes, pro, pronouns as well. And so that was helpful, very helpful. So God, it, because I'm I'm trying to get close to him, I'm trying to learn more of him, using the power of the spirit, some kind of way that it worked out that here he is with me, right? So um, when someone says that a person needs to uh, rely more on the spirit and not, and not the Greek or the Hebrew, you're, what you're really saying, what you're really saying is that a person needs to rely more on the spirit than the word that the spirit gave, which is kind of blasphemous, right? <laughs> so anyway, that being said, guys, go ahead. And if you all have, I got a little bit of time. Uh, if you want to ask some questions, if you want to cover some stuff, go ahead and um, send your questions in. Let me fix something real quick uh, because I just might do something. Go ahead and... Um... Okay, hold on. All right. I'm sorry to move this over here. All right. Now let me go back to my regular screen. All right. So. Uh, let me make sure I didn't, I didn't pass any questions. I got to move this thing down to get to, to the questions. How would you preach the gospel to non-believers? I guess is what you're asking. <clears throat> there is no right or wrong way. I've got something that keeps getting in my eye. I don't know what's going on here, but how would you preach the gospel to uh, to non-believers? How is it preached to you? Because at one point in time, you were a non-believer. There is no right or wrong way. 
Um, the heart and attitude could be the wrong way. But even in that, Paul said, when people do it the wrong way, nevertheless, at least Christ be preached. And so there's something powerful in the preaching. Oh, by the way, another Greek uh, example in Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing. Well, it's not the verb hearing. It's the now hearing, the noun hearing. So faith comes by the report of the gospel, just the report of the gospel causes salvation. That's awesome when you just think about that. But anyway, um, somebody will say, because let's say this church does this and it doesn't work out well, um, that we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't do uh, altar calls or we shouldn't do um, the little prayer of faith when someone, hey, pray this prayer, right? Well, we know that neither of those things actually causes salvation. There's a reason why people do that. And I'm, I'm not opposed to anyone. And if anyone, I don't care who it is. I don't care from, if it's MacArthur, if it's law, I don't care who it is that says you shouldn't do that, that that's wrong. I'm going to ask them book, chapter and verse, and I'm going to show them. I'm going to put my numbers of all the folks that I know have come to Christ through these altar calls, through these prayers. Here's why. Because when a person gives, when a person, uh, let's say they come down for an altar call and they acknowledge that they have um, placed faith in Christ. What happens? Well, we know that now because what you cannot have happen. I, I, when I started the outreach ministry, what I was doing was people were coming to Christ. They were placing faith in Christ and, and they were being sent out. Hey, all right, good luck. <laughs> well, that's not good either. You don't send babies out into the world. Well, if they come for an altar call, if they make this public profession of faith and people know about it. Now, what can you do? Now there can be somebody to go alongside that person and to work with that person and to help cultivate them, right? There, there'll be someone that they're not out there by themselves. So that that's that's the reason why. Now you explain to them that just because you said the words, that mean anything, if you if you repeat what I said, that mean anything. But if you believe what you said, and truth be told, before you say it, you were you were saved. The 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 faith, the trust was already there. Now you're just kind of publicly making that statement, right? And so that's why. Okay. Um it says churches don't have altars. They don't have to have altars. The point is that when they come to, y- y'all know what I mean, when they come down before, we call it an altar call, but when they come down to the front um, and they say, hey guys, this or that, whatever, there's, there's nothing, first of all, there's nothing wrong with it, okay? Um, so now, if it's not church's preference, hey man, I don't have a problem, I don't have a problem with the church not doing it, nor do I have a problem with the church doing it, okay? So as a matter of fact, <laughs> if we were to do a survey in the chats, of all you people who call yourselves Christians, how many of you all did it that way? It's going to be a whole lot of, I did it, I did it, I did it. Now, are you not saved because you did it that way? No. So <laughs> anyway, somebody said, what? he says, why did you give Chris uh, Asalo a pass? Um, Chris is a false teacher and, and his, here's why. Let me just tell you, tell you guys this. When, when, when he, when he first responded, and of course, there's not going to be a lot of folks uh, in his group is going to respond. But when he responded, uh, I was told, hey, you know what? Are you sure about this guy? This guy is combative. This guy's, and of course, even when he left here, he went on talking all kind of trash. Well, that's fine. Hey, that's, that's, that's fine. Told me that I didn't know that Lydia, I said that Lydia was a girl and not a city. And I'm like, wait a second. Lydia is a, is a girl, not a city. But he's telling people on his other channel, I'm dumb. I, I said some stupid stuff. I didn't even know that Lydia was a city and not a girl. I had to confuse. And he, and he kept saying it. Like, okay, well, fine. And so I went back and looked. Well, sure enough, buddy, Lydia is a girl, but, and he missed my whole point. Um, the point was not to, um, to be as cutting as possible, uh, although I wanted to, but his character, his, his style, uh, his combativeness, and he's, it, Chris LaSalle is a person that I don't think anyone should listen to. You just should not. Um, he's an angry person. He's a belittling person. And when I say I heard the I, I literally heard the recording, the audio recordings of of him and his wife getting into it and what she said happened. Uh, yeah. For that reason alone. Um, but then also uh, his doctrine. But did I want to have this little storm on the channel just to no? I wanted to cover the doctrine, what they believe. Now, there's a lot of other things that he didn't say that he believed that we didn't that we didn't get into. But I just wanted to go over that. And that's that's the reason why I didn't I didn't go there because I, I didn't want it to be that kind of party. You know, so anyway, uh, I think there's a time where where you should be combative. I think there's also a time where you ought to have some wisdom. And I'm trying to I'm trying to get old in a wise fashion, <laughs> not in a hurry. So anyway. 
Okay, Lisa said, I have, I have dry eyes. You know, it might be. It might be dry eyes. It, it, may, it may very well be. Was I self-taught uh, in some cases, but no. Um, God has blessed me with some people that were, got, when I, I'll tell you what, you, you all name some people that you think are giants or well-respected when it comes to understanding the scriptures. I don't care who you, who you read off. Some, some guys like, um, and, and, and again, let me say this, I'm not a Calvinist. Okay. But a lot of folks, the, the flavor of YouTube, the people that people turn to are the more reformed teachers, the, the John MacArthur's of the world, the Bodie Bacham's, the, the Lawson's and so forth. Um, well, most of these guys that, that you pick out, even those who are not reformed, let me say this. I know some guys that will just walk them down. I mean, they, they, they are one guy. He literally reads his Bible is the Hebrew and Greek Bible. And so when he's reading it, he's reading, you're thinking he's reading it in the English, but he's not. He's reading it in the Greek or in the Hebrew. And he's saying out of his mouth in English, like, okay, hey, what kind of Bible? Your Bible is small and thick. What is that? Oh, it's just, what? Did you, did you just read that thing in Hebrew and told us? And understands how this stuff is laid out. And he is going to make you earn your, earn whatever it is you say. Now, when I came up underneath him, I had already been up on another man, Dr. Bolden, who was already that way as well, who could just cut and cut and cut that the Bible just like, wow, 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 wow. Now, before him, the man that 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 taught me some things in terms of leadership uh, was a man by, man by the name of Bishop Watson, who this was in a uh, Church of God in Christ Pentecostal church. Now, the doctrine, you know, I, I reject that now, but his leadership, um, the kind of man that he was, his love for his people. I, I learned that most under him. OK, and so I've been fortunate to be around some people who have taught me uh, who I can learn from and, and grow from. I've always had some older man uh, who would pour into me or who was at least available for me to go and grab some stuff out of. And so and then obviously you got to spend spend time in it yourself. So. Yeah, uh, let's see. OK, huh? what do you. Help me understand life law. What do you mean Calvinistic reading of Greek? Or is, are you referring to somebody else? I'm not sure. But anyway. Um, do I believe in sola scriptura? Do I believe in uh, uh, scriptures alone? I do. Um, now, do I believe that uh, the, I, I, I part from when people say that uh, the only way that God speaks is through his scriptures? Uh, that would make me wonder. Well, what, what are we praying for? Why do I why do I pray? Now, do I believe that God is speaking to people like He, <laughs> like some of these guys wake up every day? I got a word from the Lord. The Lord told me this in a dream. No, but do I think that God still speaks to us? Sure, sure. He's always spoken to us, and so there's nothing in the Bible that says that He doesn't. And when they go, when people go to Hebrews one, that's not talking about Him speaking to us. Like that's not that is not what that pastor says. And I will tell, I'll ask anyone. Make that make sense to me, to Hebrews 1. If any of you all in the chat believe so, I'm going to ask you, make that, make Hebrews 1 make sense to me. Now, um, whatever he says, what, however you felt like the Lord is leading you, and I believe he leads us, that's his speaking. Obviously, he's not speaking, you know, uh, hey, Corey, you ought to this or that. Now, do I think that if God is, and here's where, here's where it doesn't make sense, if God is sovereign, and if God is ordaining some things, do I think he's ordaining everything that he, or he did? He ordained me to get this microphone or to get this color shirt. No, I don't think that. Now, did he ordain me to get this cult? Obviously, he ordained me to get this. That makes sense, right? Um, he, did he ordain me to not be a Cowboys fan? Clearly, clearly. God is looking out after, after my man, right? So anyway, but can I say that if God is sovereign, can I say that God has purpose He's got a, a specific plan for me and that I need to go to work at this particular job. And that's going to fulfill a particular purpose or plan that he has. Well, sure. God still works. He still works. If the devil is busy, then so too is God. And so will that necessarily mean that some kind of way that he moves or ordains and worked in people's lives? Yeah. You cannot believe in the sovereignty of God and believe that God didn't speak to you. You cannot. It doesn't mean because if he's ordaining things to happen, how is he causing it to happen if he's not leading you? Now, do I believe he's speaking? Hey, Bob. 
Uh, we want you to turn the light off. Uh, hey, Bob, I want you to turn the channel 15. I say turn channel 15 like we got regular TV. <laughs> but y'all get my point. So um, uh, anyway, uh, so I believe in scriptures only. And so if you felt feel like the Lord is leading you any particular way, the first thing you do is lean on the scripture. Make sure that however you feel like the Lord is leading you, that it lines up with scripture. That's why, again, I'm not somebody who's for promoting all the, the spiritual gifts and so forth. But if someone says, no, the, the, the spiritual gifts are still there. OK, well, fine, fine, fine. I'm going to lean on scriptures. So, so if I see you so-called speaking in tongues and it doesn't line up with the scriptures, you out of here. If I see you, you say you healing people and it doesn't line up with scriptures, you out of here. Don't tell me you got this gift and you're not doing it. And I don't see I don't see the Lord being magnified. Oh, you out of here. The, the Bible gives us a clear guideline, a clear blueprint on how things ought to be done. Even when someone says the Lord said, OK, fine, let's see if what he says lined up with, with what we know he said in the scripture. And so that's kind of how I do that anyway. Um, <laughs> this guy said football season's over. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait a second. Hey, brother, listen. Uh, it's an awesome Colts cup. Why is this bigger on some people? Okay, I know why. I know why yours is larger than, than, the, than the average person. Because you're a Colts fan. That's why you're... Uh, let me see if I can fix this, though. Some of these are... All right. Because... Whatever, for whatever reason, this thing is larger on, on my screen. Anyway, there it is. Um, that's an awesome Colts Cup. As a Muslim, I'm considering Christianity before uh, I do. How do I know what's the correct doctrine? God bless and go Colts. First of all, um, what a great way to start off a conversation and then end it. But in all seriousness, I believe this. And I've seen, I know, I know of some Muslim brothers who have come to Christ. I believe this, that God has always wanted to have a relationship with his creation. That's us. And I don't think that God waited some, um, some thousand years um, to send Muhammad. I think that what the scriptures say are true. I think it's the only book with predictive prophecy that has come true. And so just the evidence alone, just the evidence alone leads me. So this is what I'll say to you. This is what was said to me. And I believe it to be true that if you just in a sincere fashion, Lord, I don't know. I'm, I, there's something tugging me. There's something I'm feeling. So Lord, I'm not there. I'm not sure if you're there because that's how I did. I, I don't know if you're real, but if you are, I believe you, I believe you'll make yourself evident to me. And so father, I want God, I want to know, should I should I place my faith and trust in what you did on the cross? Because you already know, brother, you already know uh, that you can't do the right thing. You, you, you keep messing up. You keep sinning. You keep falling. You, you already know that. That's evident. We all have that problem. Not just you. I do. Um, believers and non-believers alike. We all have that same problem. The difference is, though, um, if you fail in your sin and you have not trusted for what Christ has done on the cross, that Christ paid the debt that we owe because God doesn't like when we mess up. And if you if the debt that needs to be paid is paid by him and you trust that it is. If he's your Lord, if, if, if Christ is, if you have the son, the Bible tells us that you, my friend, are set free. You are free and then your reward will be heaven. That means that you're not going to mess up again because you will. You'll mess up less and less. But you'll still mess up. You'll still sin, but you'll sin less and less and less. OK, um, but the good news is well, now you belong to a household. You belong to a family um, who is bound by blood to take care of you, to look out after you, to pray for you, to be there for you. Of course, now the flip side, you're also bound by blood to do the same thing. But you're part of a family. And who's at the head of the dinner table? God, the father is there. OK, and so um, if you would, brother, I'd Give me, um, send me an email. We can talk smart Christian channel at Gmail and we can, we can talk more. Uh, I'd love to have this conversation with you, but, uh, this is more serious than anything that we can talk about, about uh, any doctrinal issues, because it doesn't matter if a person believes in once they've always saved, if they're not saved, it doesn't matter if a person believes in the gifts of the tongue, whether they've ceased or not, if they don't know Christ. And so 
I think that's the most important thing. Even if you become a believer and don't believe all things I believe, that's perfectly fine. But I want you to become a brother in the Lord. Amen. Besides, besides, uh, you're too smart not to be a Christian. You are you are too smart not to be a Christian. Okay. Anyway, um, but yeah, but if you can send me an email so we can so we can talk. All right, we got a few more minutes. Um, Ivan Skoll says Matthew 18, 21 through 35. You would give you would give me 14, 14 um, verses to read, huh, Ivan? Let's go there, though. <laughs> uh, you said Matthew 18. Oh, wrong one. Yeah, Matthew 18. Uh, let's see. Oh, wrong one. Let me take that off here. Eighteen. Oh, put the 21 in. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As, uh, as many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talent. And the second, I'm sorry, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of the pity of him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went to put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you that debt because you pleaded me, plead with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I've had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debts. Also, I mean, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So you're asking, how does that, how does that jive with, uh, you said with one saved, always saved? Well, we see the person's heart, right? This person is not forgiving. Well, if a person is in Christ, if a person's a believer, well, then what happens to his heart? Guys, I think we, sometimes we miss, I'm not saying you, but but here's what we miss sometimes about being a Christian. Being a Christian means when you have a repentant heart, your whole disposition has changed. And so what's going to change? You're also going to have a, a forgiving nature. Now, are you going to be forgiving uh, on everything initially to the same degree that everyone else is? Well, probably not. This going I mean, are you going to be perfect in all the things that you're supposed to be as far as a believer? No. But if a person holds grudges and considering what was just done, because this is pretty vivid. This is pretty vivid. Here's a guy who owes a ton of money and had it forgiven. And then here's a guy who owes a little bit of money and you're going to do this to him. Well, that clearly demonstrates how wicked, how, how um, your heart has not been changed. And so if you can't have, because the same way that you'll judge, uh, that's the same way that you'll be judged with God. Because what happens is uh, you place you place priority uh, in your well-being and in who you are. You're egotistical. You're arrogant. You've got pride because it's all about you, like it is with this person here. And that person is not a believer. I don't care what anyone says. And so that kind of person, we see those people all the time. If you If you don't have a repentant heart, to be a believer, all these things have taken place. You have a repentant heart. You have a brand new heart, a new disposition. You have been baptized into the Holy Spirit. Okay, so these are things that happen. You are also a disciple. You begin following Christ. Now, you don't follow Christ in a straight line. <laughs> we just don't. We follow him like this, right? And so every now and then, something got to kind of push us back and move us over. So <laughs> that's kind of how we follow Christ. Now, hopefully, it's it's kind of more like this. We're following Christ in the beginning, but as we go, it gets more like this and more, you know, and then eventually... 
our following will be straight. So we are to be also immediate, immediate disciples as well. Okay. So anyway, uh, I hope that helps. Oh, uh, got a couple more minutes. Okay. Here's a good question. Hi, I want to start sharing Christian content, starting with my own, with my story of salvation. How would you recommend I start? Um, I would recommend you start as soon as possible. Um, I didn't remember. I don't know anything about technology. I really don't. Uh, I struggle with some of this stuff and I'm, I'm learning as I go, but I just, they, my kids said, Hey, you know, uh, you're trying to, this, this teaching ministry, just put it on YouTube. How does how does that work? And them trying to remember, guys, remember, I'm not making this up. I'm not exaggerating. I just learned, I don't know, a matter of weeks ago, what a meme is. Now, you all know that stuff because you've been, you, I'm not familiar. I, I wasn't familiar with that stuff. And so my point is technology is just foreign to me. And I started it. Just get you a camera um, or get your phone, uh, get you a mic. You, you do want to have a mic. You don't want to just talk into your camera phone and, and they're, they're cheap. You can get a, a lapel mic that's $20 and I, I don't, you don't have to get the, the most expensive because they're all going to break. I don't, the most expensive lapel mic is going to break. So get you a cheap, uh, a decent $20, $30 lapel mic and start recording. If you, if you don't have good lighting, wait till the sun comes up and, and do it that way or go and buy you a um, $40, $50 light. But if you've got something that you feel like can benefit someone else, then go ahead and start. Um, everyone is not going to be successful on YouTube. I don't care if every Christian is not. OK, um, but start anyway. Who knows? Start and let's see where, where God takes you. And there might be someone who get blessed by what you said, who can relate to what you're saying. It's like, man, this person just thoroughly blessed me. So start by just starting. That's what you do. OK. And there's more than enough room here on YouTube for people uh, who love the Lord to, to, to share the gospel. There is. All right. Let me slide to the bottom. OK. Oh, hold on. Hold on. OK. Um. He says smartphones were not out and we got locked up. Well, <laughs> yeah, hey, Gino, listen, and, and where we were, uh, it was when I got there, there was a lock on smartphones. Um, but, you know, the spot that I was at before that, they did have the, the, uh, the smartphones. I, I didn't have them. And so uh, I know guys were using it and you'd see guys up late at night on their on their cell phones, looking out for the guards and so forth. But Anyway, yeah, the spot that we went to, they had they had the phones on lock, so you couldn't really get to them. Um, hold on, hold on. I'm coming back to your question in just a second. Um, okay, okay. Um, tell you what, I can't, I can't do it, Mr. K. I can't do it right now. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. Um, I will, I will get, I will. Send me an email, um, Cody. We'll, we'll talk about having you. We'll, we'll we'll bring you on. We'll talk about this this whole issue of Revelation twenty two, um, so I can straighten you out. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but send, send me an email so we can cover that. Let me go to this question. Um, can you review Acts sixteen seventeen? I heard the girl with the spirit of divination was actually um, saying a way and not the way. Uh, please check your Greek. Okay, I've got it. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> what's funny is I got a message from my from my staff that says uh, Mr. K wants to come on. So, <laughs> um, so Mr. K, send me an email. We're gonna we, we'll set up. If I don't, if I can promise you, it definitely won't be today because I'm getting ready to get off in just a second here, um, and it won't be tomorrow, uh, and it won't be Friday. And it definitely won't be Saturday, guys. We will have we will have the class on Saturday. There's a with all the bad weather here, the roofers are not coming, so we'll have it Saturday. So either we'll um, I'll bring you on either Monday or Wednesday. The roofers are going to be here Tuesday, so it'll be Monday or Wednesday. Okay, so send me an email. And we'll, we'll we'll figure this out. But anyway, uh, let's get back to your question. Go to Acts sixteen seventeen, and let's look at what the lady said. Acts sixteen seventeen. Uh, she followed Paul uh, and us, uh, 
crying out, these men are servants of the Most High uh, who, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Okay. And so you're, ask, you're asking the question is, um, is she saying the way or a way? Well, let's go over here to the right side and let's look at the Greek. It says, uh, whom, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, hoitenes, which is who, this person who is, this girl, referring to her, she is uh, Katanga Angelusen. She is proclaiming, she's preaching, she's crying out, um, she's announcing uh, to you. They're annou- they are, I'm sorry, they are announcing to you, and here it is, the word way, Hadan. Hadan Soterias. Now, is it the way or a way? Uh, it just says a way. It's not definite uh, because there's no definite article. Uh, this is anarthrus. And so in this case, it is a way. But is it referring to a particular way? Is she referring to uh, salvation uh, that she's speaking of? I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, and so if your if your Bible's translated that that she says, let's see, how does how does this translate over here? Uh, this over here says the way. Um, I would have to um, kind of look up some more to see. Matter of fact, let's do this. Let's pull over. Uh, will this help? Where's it at? Doggone it. Where's it at? It's in here somewhere. I'm looking for my. Um, oh, show interlinear. Let's pull it back up and let's see if my little interlinear helps. Corey out. And it doesn't. (laughs) It doesn't. Um, Yeah. Um, It's not, it's not saying if this is now, here's the other thing though, just because a word is missing um, a definite article doesn't mean that it's not definite. Um, there are certain things that, that will have to happen, and I don't, I'm not sure if they're there or not, but just in the word the is not there. Um, but the ESV has the word the there. Uh, why? Why do the translators think that that should be there? Let's look at another translation and see. Did I even put that on the screen? I'm sorry. I went and did all that. I'm not sure if I even put that on the screen. Let's go to the King James Version and see uh, if it also translates the same way. The King James Version. Yeah, they're just saying, um, showed us the way. Now, so it has a definite article in the English. One of two things. Either it should have the definite article, it should have the the there, or it shouldn't. Um, But you can imply that it's definite. I don't know. Now, there are a lot of times where we do imply that something belongs there and, and, and it's just out of our own doctrinal um, issues that we do so uh, and it shouldn't be. So, or just to kind of clarify because we might know. Now, based on just looking at it, can I tell that, that um, see, as we were going to the place, let's, let me read it again, make sure I'm not missing anything. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High who proclaim to you the way. And she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned uh, and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. Now, here's what it could be, though. Again, there's no way really to know, but here's what it could be. She could be, and I think that's probably what it was. Obviously, she's mocking them. And so she's like, hey, guys, they found the way to heaven. They, they, that might be what she's saying. That Not that she was actually, obviously, she clearly wasn't saved. She clearly she clearly, clearly was not a preacher of the gospel. Um, but she's saying that, that these people are, are preaching the way to salvation, kind of in a way to make fun. Hey, y'all, get, get, get your tickets to go to heaven, y'all. They, 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 they've got this thing down, right? They figured out a way. So she's mocking, and maybe that's why they put the the in there, because she's referring to what they're talking about. Um, But she clearly wasn't uh, a believer herself. So uh, all right. 
Ron, the servant, thank you. So you said Proverbs 18.21. Let's go to Proverbs 18.21. Proverbs 18, 21. All right. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Okay. <clears throat> it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that um, your tongue can cause something to live or to die. The point is that there is movement that's caused by the tongue. Um, as James says, that the little tongue can set every a whole can set a force ablaze. It can do so much damage to that mouth. Of course, nowadays it's not the mouth; it's just the, it's the typing. But the same the same principle, okay? And it's not to be taken as that um, I can speak somebody to die or speak uh, somebody to live, or I can always speak life or death into a situation. Now, you can make a situation more alive. Uh, you can pour water on a on a on a fire with your mouth. Um, you can, if you want to do something with your life or there's something that you want to do, you can, you can make it harder. Talk it down. I'm not going to be able, you can be like Eeyore on Winnie the Pooh. It's not going to work. It's just, I don't know why I'm even here. Why I even bother? Right. Well, in that fashion, yeah, you, you're speaking death to it, but are you really killing it? Not, not in the literal sense. Okay. And so this is more figurative. This is more, uh, anthropomorphic. Uh, because this is kind of how we can understand it, right? And we talk we talk the same way too. We use um, figurative language often when we're talking. And so you're killing me, man. You're killing me, right? I don't mean that you're literally killing me, but man, come on, will you stop? So that's kind of the same way that that is. All right, I got a, a couple, actually past my time, but I got a couple more minutes. Let's go ahead. Let me do one or two more. Um, when is the rapture video? That's why I'm not, that's why uh, uh, Mr. K can't come on. Um, because it's either it's either going to be. <laughs> Let me tell you the two videos for this week, guys. Wait a second. I'm sorry. There's three videos left, bef um, and between tomorrow, Friday, and Monday, the three videos. I'm not sure which which going to show when. Um, one is going to be on uh, eschatology, on the on on the tribulation, and so forth. Uh, there's one, I'm not going to tell you what this other one's going to be. And the other one is going to be about Calvinists and Calvinism. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna make it clear, guys. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not against Calvinism. There's a lot of things we have in common. So we're going to talk about that. All right. Uh, how did you learn to pronounce the Greek words by the, by the book? Um, it tells you, by the way, you know, what's funny when we say like, like the word for pie, not pi that you eat, but the, 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 in math or in the Greek letter pi, it's not actually pi, it's actually P. Uh, we say, um, psi, phi, it's no, it's, it's, it's C, it's phi, it's key, it's P. It's not, it's not the I sound, it's the E sound. So, but you would think that in college when, with these Greeks, they would know that, but that's literally how, how those are pronounced. And so, the, the, the textbooks will, will, will show you, it'll tell you, okay, this is pronounced with this, with this spelling. They'll give you an example of a word that's spelled the same way. So it, when I tell you guys that learning Greek and Hebrew, um, it's time consuming, but it's not hard. Let me put it that way. It's, it's time consuming, but it's not hard. And there are different things that you can do, different, um, lessons that you can find to help you go faster with it. Okay. So anyway, um, Okay, King Raj, what'd you say? What is what are my thoughts on Matthew eleven nineteen? The same as stated in, in Luke chapter five. So let's go to Matthew eleven. I thank you. That's not a long one. That you didn't give me uh, thirty passages like <laughs> like uh, Ivan did. You said uh, Matthew. All right. Let's see. Matthew 11, Matthew eleven nineteen. the son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. So your question is what? I'm trying to help me out with, with um, what exactly is, is the question. Are you talking about what they said about him being a glutton and a drunkard? Um, drunkard. Um, all they were doing was just looking at, at anything they can do to kind of impugn him and his credibility, um, because guess what he was drinking? He was drinking wine. 
but he wasn't drunk, obviously, um, him eating. Well, these Pharisees, these Jews, uh, these people who were concerned about their appearance, they didn't eat in front of people. They didn't do these certain things in front of people. Now, obviously, they did things and they did some, a lot of sin. And so they wanted to impugn Jesus in any way, shape, or fashion that they could. Hey, he's hanging with the tax collectors. Well, you guys are friends of the tax collectors. You're just friends with them um, behind the scenes. So, all right, let me. Oh, okay, you're talking about wisdom. Okay, why, why did he refer to wisdom uh, as her deeds? Um, is that wisdom, is that a spirit wisdom? A what? A spirit? Okay, let me see if I'm reading this right. Why did he re why did he refer to wisdom? Why he referred to wisdom as her? Uh, and is that a spiritual? Oh, I should say, um, her. Don't read into the her part. Um, it's just how do I put this? We use the term her. Um, oftentimes, we give a gender um, to something. I don't want to say gender. Uh, but we give it, uh, make something feminine uh, or not like, hey, I'm driving my car and, I, and it's, it's a girl's name. I mean, the car is actually an actual lady. Uh, and so I wouldn't I wouldn't read into that. And so and he's just saying, you uh, first of all, you guys are idiots. That's not you. but <laughs> It's kind of my way of Jesus saying you guys are idiots. Uh, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Um, he's trying to teach them. They're not listening. <laughs> but uh, don't 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 read into the her. That doesn't mean anything. It, it's it's uh, it's, and of course now the the word that's used here is the the feminine of her our, our taste, but it's not meant to to convey anything having to do with um, anything deep. It really isn't. It's just really more uh, a figure of speech. So anyway, um, all right. So a couple of things um, <clears throat> on the handout. Um, You'd like to do a teaching, like me to do a teaching on uh, the growing pro gay theology. Yeah, I, I, I actually am. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to put together something that that is kind of um, more than just me. So I've got to go through different resources and grab something here, someone here. What this person is saying, what this person is saying, what's happening over here. And I don't want to do it just from from the standpoint of here in America. I want to also brought bring in what's happening in Canada with their new bill. Uh, and what it actually means, because it because this whole gay pro, the, gay pro, <laughs> I guess gay, uh, <laughs> I guess it is a profession now. But this whole pro gay movement uh, is more than just homosexuality. Uh, there's a reason for it and, it, and it comes across more than just someone's sexuality. But if that wasn't bad enough, so uh, I want to cover it from a lot of different areas, and so it's probably it's, it's it's a couple of weeks away. I I can tell you that, but it is coming. It is coming. Now, as far as the handout, the handout, guys, I put the handout together. And the problem is the handout, as I'm looking on the screen, is not the same size that you guys would get it. And so I got to fix that. So um, I've got to go through each one and actually have all the stuff changed. Uh, that was going to be on yesterday. And I'm looking at today. It's like, no, no. And then I even printed out one just to make sure. And again, me and technology, but I'll get it straight, though. I'll get it straight. And I, I, I could have had someone to type it up for me. But anyway. Um, so, guys, uh, this has been wonderful. I shall see you all tomorrow. What is that? I shall see you all tomorrow. Um, stay blessed. Stay warm. Stay safe. Amen.